obviously, Bill Ackman's valiant trade turned into about as close as a complete wipeout as you can get. Actually, uh, Matt Levine and Bloomberg View did a calculation, and he actually might have lost more than 100% of his total investment because uh, he did all these options trades on top of going long the stock. In terms, how often does something like this happen in the activist world? You know, for someone like uh, for someone like Ackman, this is not his first rodeo with having a, you know a stock go bad. And in the main, though, he's a very, very disciplined investor. He's old school. And he's got, a, as Julie pointed out earlier, a small number of positions. And that's different than a Paulson that might spread that out over a large number. In the case of Ackman, I think two things really crushed it. And again, it's a sign of, you know, even if he's lost a ton of money, there is an element of investment discipline shown on this thing. For him, it's about EBITDA, EBITDA, EBITDA. Because the loan book requires $1.8 billion a year, roughly, to finance. The strategy of Valiant was relatively simple. Buy up companies, incur debt, mm. buy up companies, incur debt. Mm -hmm. And if he did not, if, the, if their EBITDA to uh, loan ratio falls below around two, all of these things have to be re, you know, refinanced, and they're perilously close. $1.8 billion is a lot of money you've got to make just to pay the bankers every year. Um, and when that started to fall apart, I think that that's the, you know, the, the gasoline. And the matches where he's disciplined is his central thesis that you could roll up companies and raise prices fell apart. And, uh, and I think that he was disciplined to some degree, even if he is only taking like $200 million, which is roughly what he has on his Metro card. Um, you know, out of this trade at this point, and as you say, he may have well lost, lost more than that in total, uh, all, all the way around, it's actually, I think, you know, as I say, it's not his first rodeo and he's, mm. he's getting out. So Ackman sold out of his positions, but how do activists usually exit their positions? Is it, usually it's not necessarily a spectacular loss um, as the way this one has been perceived, but how, how did they come out of it? Sure. That's one of the great challenges because when you're an activist, you're the elephant in the room and you get hundreds of people that follow along behind you, right? And then you're always the hardest one to get back out. About 60% of, uh, of, of these things end in stock sales, just what Bill's doing today, just mm -hmm. you know, bleeding it off in the market bit by bit. But actually, the, the exit of choice is about the one third that gets done through, uh, through mergers. You really want to try to get someone else to take the entire position off of your hands. And we've seen situations where people end up you know, with so-called successful activist positions, but then they can't get out. You're the last person to get out after everyone else has had, after you've sold off the division or made the structural changes you want. You know, part of what made uh, Bill Ackman, part of what sort of characterized Bill Ackman's approach in recent years and other managers too, were these sort of big showy presentations about their announcements where they sort of unveiled the trade and then walked through this long thesis. Hours and, and hours of PowerPoint. Event. Uh, it, it attracts a lot of attention from people, theoretically people who want to take the opposite side of the trade. Do you think that's going to fade a little bit or do you think that's, cause, or is that sort of a sound thing to do for an activist? Uh, is it a, I think those are two different questions. Um, but, uh, you know, you're right. A lot of these guys come out like it's, you know, the start of a Formula One race. They right. drop the checkered flag with a big announcement. But in reality, uh, you know, what the reason why people have to do that is if, if you look at the makeup of activist investors, activists have actually, professional full-time activists, are relatively flat in the number of campaigns, around 300, 307 last year, 302 this year. What's been driving the flow? are the part-time people, the people that will do this as an occasional trade. And so what we see is much larger numbers of part-time uh, mm. uh, uh, people. So by doing those big presentations, you hope to get that wave of, uh, you know, people to follow, along, to follow along with you. And that's been a large structural change. Firms that would never have gotten involved in that before have. Look, BlackRock went activist on a stock in Hong Kong. These are not full-time activists, mm. but if, you know, if, 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 if they follow along your investment thesis, I think you've got some pretty deep pockets behind you. Well, speaking of Hong Kong, one thing we've noticed is how activists have started to take their approach globally. You had activists target Sony, for instance, Samsung Electronics as well. This was not something we had seen maybe five, six years ago. Absolutely. And uh, really, the growth has been globally. We're not going to say that in terms of numbers of deals, it's massive mm -hmm. uh, offshore. But it's interesting. You know, the UK has always been the, uh, the leading edge of, of uh, European activism. And in fact, I think they had the first activist uh, get a board appointment on a FTSE 100 company 
which had never been done before last year. Uh, but also, you know, Shinzo Abe in, uh, in Japan, I think, welcomes this. He's trying one way or another to sort of drag this Kairetsu system out and make it happen. Yeah, I was just going to ask about that. I know that sort of uh, Japanese corporates are famously sort of resistant to this sort of thing. Do you see evidence that the culture is changing or is it still just, is it still just a goal at this point? Well, years and years ago, we, we, you know, we were an investor in a fund that was beating up on bulldog sauce. And I will never remember or taste bulldog sauce again because it was extraordinarily strange in that you would go to the large investors and say, by the way, you know, at Sapporo, this corporate structure is just ripping you off. And they'd be like, yeah, well, they're friends. And it, it just, it's a mm. cultural reaction that's going to take a, an investment generation. But if you sit flat in the stock market long enough, eventually people get frustrated. And look, in Asia, we've seen about 77 activist uh, campaigns up from 52 last year. We've even seen them in China on the Hong Kong exchange. We've seen them in Japan. Yeah. It's catching on, but 77 is not exactly uh, 456, which is what we saw in the United States last year. And that's 77 across all Asia. On the Gulf Coast, new ExxonMobil projects are expected to create over 45,000 jobs. These are jobs that natural gas is helping make happen, all while reducing America's emissions. Energy lives here. What a great story, uh, top 10 story on the Bloomberg today. So obviously a lot of people here uh, caring about what's happening. Is this because Apple needs to sort of uh, indicate what its next, you know, uh, interesting project is going to be? What do you think is the, behind the interest here as far as investors are concerned? Right. There's been a lot of talk about what comes after the iPhone. A few years ago, people thought it was the Apple Watch, a computer for your wrists. There's been talk of self-driving cars revolutionizing TV, new iCloud services. The AR is really where it's at for Apple, and we're going to